Jamie O'Neill's journey started early with her family band, which gave her an unconventional upbringing. We had private tutors. We didn't go to, you know, traditional school um, until we were much older. And so it was just always about the music. She would eventually head back to her native country of Australia and tour with the country's biggest superstar, Kylie Minogue. And I was just touring the world and I was like 23 years old. The musical talent runs throughout Jamie's family and her daughter Aaliyah is now pursuing her own music career. It's had that ownership and it's like nobody can really take that away from you. It's something that you've written. She writes a lot by herself. So she is a multi-platinum selling Grammy nominated artist here on the John Deere stage on the record with Jamie O'Neill. Boy, song after song. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. You know, of course, standout song. And, and do you agree that There Is No Arizona, your signature song? I think so. I think most people mention that one first off the bat. Mm -hmm. Like even at shows, they're like, I just remember when that song came out, so I, I guess, you know, I would call that the swan song. The swan. Well, and the first one out of the gate, too, and we're going to talk yeah. about that becoming really, you get signed to a record label, release that song, and boom, you shot up to the top of the charts at number one. But I thought we would go back, and I mean back, back. A lot of people, I mean, I don't know, in this day and age, if people know that you were born in Australia. Mm -hmm. And for people that do, they go, well, why don't you have an accent? Well, you know, you were just there as a little girl. It gets just... super confusing. Yeah. I mean, there's, <laughs> I've lived so many different places and been geographically challenged, I guess. You were with a, a family band. Your parents mm -hmm. were performers, your younger sister. Mm -hmm. So talk about traveling as, is that the reason the move is? Did your father think, well, there are more opportunities for music here in the States? Oh, absolutely. Um, my dad and mom had been in Australia and, you know, performed with the Bee Gees. My dad was actually in a duo with his sister back in the late 50s and 60s performing in New Zealand and had number one records. And my mom was a dancer in Australia and he happened to go on Australian bandstand and she was on there. That's how they met. So it started the whole musical journey for them as a duo. And then we joined the act. So it's always been chasing the dream. It's always mm -hmm. been the goal of doing music and getting to the States. And I think Helen Reddy was another one who was a huge influence on my dad and said, oh, you've got to go to the States. You know, that's where that's where you need to be. Traveling around. And I love this story. And I want you to share this. Literally, I mean, can I say gypsies? I mean, you talk yeah. about living, was it a van? Was it a bus that you all lived in? Any and all of the above. We really? actually started out with um, just getting on a Greyhound bus, believe it or not, with the musicians and all of our suitcases. And we had no home when we arrived in LA. And we got on the Greyhound bus and like drove through the night to get to like the first booking. And my dad always says, you know, as little kids, we would always wake up and go, is this where we're living? Is this our home? And it would break my mom's heart because she really didn't want to raise us on the road. Mm. But with the dream and the goal of like, okay, eventually we're getting somewhere, we're going to get settled, um, never really happened. We always were living out of our RV. We got a big motor home and we would go to KOA campgrounds in between the next gig. So it was always like living for that. We had private tutors. We didn't go to, you know, traditional school. Um, until we were much older. And so it was just always about the music. You know, it always mm -hmm. has been. So. And that was your father's big dream. Did you mm -hmm. find that your mother kind of followed suit? And were you guys, you were young, so you're like, whatever you want to do. Yeah, my mom really didn't love being on the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't really her dream to, you know, get a record deal and do, do anything. She, I think, really wanted to get settled. But she was happy to see us do music as kids, mm -hmm. you know, to 
to follow that. And she always fostered that love and said, you can do anything you want. I never not, I didn't, I never didn't believe in myself. And I think that yeah. came from my parents. Like you can do anything. It is possible. There was never any talk of like, go to college, you know, right. get a degree, nothing. It was always about music. Music, music. Yeah. And you wound up as a young kid, as a family band, mm -hmm. for people who may know the old TNN days, right? It was Ralph Emery show. Pop Goes the Country, Ralph Emery, and we did Mike Douglas. Wow. We did the Bob Braun show out of Ohio like 20 times. <laughs> Just remember Bob Braun, you know, as he, when you're little too, it's like these characters are like huger than life. You know, mm. Mike Douglas, like I'd watch Mike Douglas was like Johnny Carson, you know, who so was going booking on there. you? Was this your father? Because well, you, you know, it's, it's funny you say that because Tony Conway was a big booker of the Murphy family and got us a lot of gigs. So people who may not know Tony Conway here yes. in Nashville, he's really huge. is uh, he's the the guy, the guy he's going to be placing you, booking you. He's the guy you want to be. And he manages with. Lori Morgan yeah. and he's, you know, at, been with Alabama for years and produces so many different amazing events every year so it's great to see him every time I run into him. So you were getting places as mm -hmm. a family band I mean you were doing there were these highlights these moments of real success that people would strive for right now in this day and age any day and age really yeah it was happening for the family band. It was on a certain level mm -hmm. but it was never you know quite getting you know getting to that point of you know, making music that was original and getting a record deal, those things didn't happen. But we worked with some great people. I mean, Mark Wright we worked with back then, um, Gary Paxton, Larry London, James Stroud. You know, all these people go back to my childhood, my, my years when I was like 11, 12, 13. You talk about you know. an education. Yeah. And this was a foundation for what was to come. Yeah. Unbeknownst to you, you had no idea what was coming up as your career would just skyrocket. I want to talk about, I mean, for people who may not know, your parents would wind up divorcing, and that mm -hmm. would be the... That's the, what showbiz the, will do for yeah, you. Yeah, right? I mean, the Try end. being locked in a van, you know, marriage, the act, everything I that can't goes imagine. with it. Yeah. It's, it's And that had to be yeah. hard for you as kids, too, mm -hmm. because you were such a tight family unit. Yes, and I mean, I remember my parents getting into really bad fights after certain big shows where they like, it weighed on them so much. It was the importance of it was just like, I think about that now with myself. I'm like, we're doing music. We're not, mm -hmm. you know, saving people. We're, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's not like we went to school to save lives or curing cancer. You know what I'm saying? So. I feel like I don't, I try to not let the bigger opportunities become the most important thing. Like mm -hmm. I'll always have in check fam my family, my daughter, like that comes first. Right. Even my dogs yeah. come first, yeah. you know? And, but I remember my parents like blowing up, like we worked with John Davidson and he said something like that my mom was a weak link in the act. And they got into this, you know, almighty mm. fight because my dad was like, well, he thought this. and you should do this and like so those fights on the road was very tumultuous some great moments some not so great moments for sure we i learned that, a lot from that we hear a lot from that as bands i cannot being uh, i cannot imagine being a family unit and of course naomi mm. and winona you know the judge the history of of the battles that went on mm -hmm. uh, on the road so in it's inevitable in a way yeah um, and especially hard when it's a family uh, from that, though, you launched a career, and we're going to talk about that a lot more with Jamie O'Neill here on The Record. Stay with us. Keith was one of those people that had a vision. I mean, he knew immediately, and more than I did even, that he's like, this is the song that's going to break you, and I'm like, maybe. We are on the record with Jamie O'Neill. I love that song. You know that. Thank Seeing you. that video yes, shiver. Gosh, yes. I, probably, and I, I say it to this day, I don't care what's out there, that is probably the sexiest song. That's if you so guys sad. have not heard the song in its entirety, do yourself a favor. Listen to it. It's such a great song. And um, the video, see the video where the guy had spray on abs. Is that <laughs> I always love that. I love seeing him get makeup sprayed on for the abs because I'm like, 
that made my husband feel really good. He's like, I don't feel so bad that I'm not in the video now when I see that they had to spray abs they on the have, guy. And then a lot of guys going, now I could do that? <laughs> yes, yeah. you could actually spray them on. Before the break, we were talking about the family, uh, the family band and, and things coming to an end with that stage of your career and your life. Mm -hmm. um, when the divorce happened between your parents, the question was, would you go with, did your mom go back to Australia? And where did you fall in that? That was a really devastating, awful time. Mm -hmm. Because I know for me, like I said, music has always been everything. In terms of an escape and a healing as well, for me, was just like, well, I'll always have my music. Well, that doesn't matter because I've got music and I can just, you know, escape into that, whether it's being on stage or, you know, even when I'm writing and things like that. So I would ignore and push down the emotions of, you know, my parents splitting up, but mm -hmm. also splitting up the act because for a while there, um, my, my younger sister got off the road and my dad, my mom and I went out as a trio. And then that went from a trio down to a duo. My dad and I did a duo for five minutes. Um, so it just kept, it kept kind of morphing and changing and lessening and just the, the fighting and everything. It was just a very tumultuous time. Um, but I, I kind of kept up the, the thought that I was going to do a solo thing and that would be, everything would be okay. But, um, for a while there, I was waiting tables. I worked at 101st Airborne here in Nashville. Mm. Um, so which there was I a hustle. Loved. Right. There just, was a hustle. It yeah, was a hustle sure. to stay afloat. But it was right. a different kind of a hustle, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. And my mom would slip. I was going to say, was that nice for you so that wasn't always about music? Was that a break for you? No. Did you look at that? No, you didn't no, look at it that No, not way. at all. It wasn't, it wasn't nice. It wasn't no. a, <laughs> not a lot of nice going on. The best thing was two of my best friends that mm. are still my best friends, Cindy and John Lee, who you know, um, worked with me in these in the restaurants, 101st Airborne, and and John was working in other places, and so we we became best friends and mm. stayed best friends, right. and have been through so much together, you know. Um, but my mom, the funny thing is, she would slip anybody who came through the door that had anything to do with music, she would strike up a conversation and give them a demo tape. Here's my daughter's demo tape. Here's my. So, so your mom was working. My there? mom was waiting tables. I was waiting, waiting tables. tables. My wow. sister was a hostess. Oh wow! We all worked together. So it was a family affair yet again. My dad okay. had remarried and moved um, to Washington, um, and so we were, yeah, the three of us family were just unit. Yeah. yeah, stayed together. Yeah. Inevitably, you would wind up going back to Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who may not know, Kyla Minogue, a big Australian, well, global artist, yeah, really. Very um, much she was so. just on network television. They did a feature on her because she's got a Vegas residency. Never really blew up here in the States. Right. But when you went over there, you were singing with her. You were part of her band, right? Right. Was that right. next level for you? Because she was doing arena dates, wasn't oh, she, at the time? Yeah. The touring was incredible. I learned so much to have gone from the kind of shows I had done as a kid mm. to playing like Wembley, you know, 60,000 people screaming and touring at that level, you know, and, wow. and on a bus going all over Europe. And we went to Asia, um, Thailand, you know, um, I'm trying to think of some of these places, France, Belgium. And I was just touring the world. And I was like 23 years old, you know, I had to be and incredible. Yeah. I mean, and she was doing what I had dreams of doing, you know, getting to play Mm -hmm. Of course, I didn't have dancers and I <laughs> want to have dancers <laughs> and all that kind of thing. And but she was very much pop. Yeah. But yeah, I just I learned so much from her and the hard work that she, you know, in a way she's like a t was like a Taylor Swift back then, mm -hmm. where she would rehearse nonstop and practice, you know, until she got it completely right for like twelve hours. We would do very long rehearsals. Wow. With lighting and you think about all that goes into a show. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do. We would rehearse for like three weeks, set up with the lights, everything. Dedication, yeah. The choreography, committed outfits, yeah. the whole costumes, whatever. You know, everything was done at that level of practicing. I'm gonna make the leap from there. Yeah. Coming back to the states, eventually you would mm -hmm. land a record deal. When you came back, probably smarter, wiser about the business, maybe more focused on what you wanted, having seen mm -hmm. her performance. Did you come back here? Were you on your own at that point? And because I know songwriting played a big part and, and still does in who you are as an artist. Did you come back into the songwriting uh, community? Is that how you really kind of took yeah, hold of Yeah, that's kind of how I kicked my way in the mm. door was, again, my mom sent a demo tape to Larry McFadden, who was best friends with Harold Shedd, uh, who worked with Alabama. Mm -hmm. And so Harold signed me to a publishing deal, but when I got over here, 
Russ Zavitson, who ran the publishing company, said, why should I have to sign you, you know, to this deal? How, you need to prove to me that you can do this. Mm. And I said, give me a three-month deal. Give me three months to prove myself. You can double book me. I want to get as many songs as I can. I would do two rights a day and prove to you that I can do this. I'll demo the songs. I'll, you know, you'll hear how I can sing the songs. So I really knew that that three, month was, three months was the time I had to prove myself. Make and it was very short. It was make mm -hmm. or break or I was going back to Australia. So was it a song that got noticed as far as your record deal? Or was it through? The first thing that happened for me was a demo that I wrote got cut by Leanne Rimes. And that kind of kick-started a little bit of a, you know, oh, she just got her first cut. Right. Um, you know, and then I got signed to EMI, and it was really EMI that, that got me started where I got to sing for Keith Stegall. Who, who became your producer is and is wonderful. And, wonderful. Yeah. Man, my champion, absolute hero that did it really everything for me and got mm. my career started, for sure. So that was the guy, and mm -hmm. then the song. So you're signed to Mercury Records, really. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the first single that comes out, There Is No Arizona. You had not had that song, from what I understand, right? At the time of, no. of signing your when deal. No, when I sang for Keith, I didn't have that song. I did have Angels mm. um, and a couple of other songs that ended up on my album. But we wrote Arizona after I'd gotten my record deal. And it, the funny thing is, as I played it for people, Keith was one of those people that, had a vision. I mean, he knew immediately, and more than I did even, that he's like, this is the song that's going to break you. And I'm like, maybe. I mean, yeah. who knows? But um, everyone else was like, that's taking a risk. You know, you're mm -hmm. scatting around doing some jazz chords. You know, that's taking a risk of something, of, of people saying, well, this isn't country. And mm -hmm. I said, I really only know how to do what I do. Right. You know, I am who I if, am. Yeah. if you're not authentic to yourself, people, the fans can sniff that out. That is so know. important. And yeah. for anybody watching, that is such an important lesson. Be yourself and don't let mm. anybody change you. The song takes off, becomes number one. I cannot imagine because here you it are. It did not happen that fast, though. <laughs> you make it sound like it's like it came out right on. The attention now is on you. Yeah. Follow up. What else you got? And I can't imagine. Was it enjoyable for you? Do you remember that? Or was it, was it a crazy time? It was a crazy time that I wish I could relive. Mm. Um, because I feel like we all have things that we say I'd go back and do differently. I would soak in the moment more and not be so bamboozled by everything. You know what I mean? It, I was pulled in a lot of different directions. My grandfather had cancer, my aunt had cancer, mm. and I was getting married and my album was coming out. And nowadays it's like I look at social media and I think people put everything out there, which I, there's a side of me that loves that because you can be yourself. If you feel something, you can say it. Mm. Back then, you have publicists saying, this is what you need to say, don't say that, uh-uh, don't go there. And so a lot of my grief that I was going through and my being, feeling overwhelmed, I felt like I had to shove down, whereas now I feel like it's great that these people can, hey, I'm, I, I'm not, you know, I'm out on tour and I need a, a break, I need a mental mm -hmm. health check. Yeah. I love that people can say that. So momentum you know. is going, and you're for forced to put a pause on everything. Yeah. A lot more. Stay with us. We're talking with Jamie O'Neill on the record. The tradition continues with your daughter now. Happy for her that she has music, like, again, as therapy to, yeah. to get her feelings out, and that, you know, to know that you can be in a room alone writing something and be just as happy as, you know, anybody doing something that's so fulfilling. To on the record, I'm Suzanne Alexander visiting with Jamie O'Neill, and I love that song, Somebody's Hero. That song paired you once again back up. Was it Shay Smith, songwriter? Yes. Because the, the two of you wrote There Is No Arizona together. And yes. And again, How Far that, From Martina. Oh, wow. And that yeah. is an amazing song, by the way. Thank I'm glad you. you brought that up. Thank Probably you. hands down, too, one of my favorite songs oh, thank by you. Martina McBride that you wrote. Um, that song mentions uh, being a mom. Yes. The most important thing I've ever done and will ever do. Yeah. The tradition continues with your daughter now. You and your husband, Rodney, have a beautiful daughter who was so good, like Taylor Swift good, like oh, just a great you. songwriter, great singer, and a performer uh, in her own right. She plays a lot of the, the local bars, especially what Old Red and Old here Red, in Nashville. She's yeah. always there, yeah. Aaliyah Good. Yeah, so she's, good. And she's she amazing. is good. I love yeah. that. that. That's her name. <laughs> you have to be so proud uh, to I'm see that. I'm very proud. And, and, and happy for her that she has music, like, again, as therapy to, yeah. 
to get her feelings out and that, you know, to know that you can be in a room alone writing something and be just as happy as, you know, anybody doing something that's so fulfilling, you know, and she found that out as an er at an early age. I mean, I don't write songs by myself and I don't play guitar. So to be, with, the first thing she wanted was a guitar when she was 12 so that she could write her own music and be like Taylor Swift. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody's like Taylor Swift, but to be able to have that ownership and it's like nobody can really take that away from you. It's something that you've written. She writes a lot by herself. And Do you guys, have you ever written together? We, we never have. No. What is that? Is that a mother-daughter thing? I don't know. Or? It's like we'll end up talking about everything so much that we just don't get around to finishing a song. Yeah. But we definitely have recorded. We recorded Somebody's uh, yes. Hero together. Highlights for you. When you look back over this career, you know, uh, during the break, you had mentioned uh, a tour that you did not want to miss out on in those early days. Yes. That's and a big highlight. Moment. Yeah. Big moment. Girls' Night Out, Reba McIntyre, Martina McBride, Sarah Evans, Carolyn Don Johnson. And those women are like my favorite people, mm -hmm. and they're, we're still in each other's lives, and Carolyn and I are like best friends. And um, it's just, you learn so much out there on tour with, with people like that, to look mm -hmm. up to Reba and Martina and see how they do it. It's like you just, it's like a dream come true. It's definitely a pinch me moment. I've seen photos of myself with a look on my face like, I can't believe I'm standing with these women, <laughs> you know, that I'm doing this on tour with them. It's, it was incredible, night after night. Coming up, I know uh, you and your husband recorded a Christmas album not too long ago, but coming up, year, uh, yeah. you're going to be working uh, on a new record, new project. Right. Um, the first single is just about to come out, and the whole album is coming out at the end of March, beginning of April. Okay. So, Tell us about this record. How many songs? It's, it's country. It really is. It's like I wanted to do the songs that I love and that... And it's kind of a mix, you know. It's so like, uh, covers? No, 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 no. no, no. Okay. They're, they're all songs Original, um, that okay. I've written, and I'm doing a, also a song that my sister wrote. My sister passed away in 2021, and this is mm -hmm. a song that she wrote, and I wanted to put one of her songs on there. And it's definitely been very moving. My dad was in the studio, and I, I was like, I can't look at him. I know this is moving for him, and I just have to get through it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just kind of wanted to do one. Of, she's an incredible artist, was an incredible singer-songwriter, too. The genetics of talent in your family. And by the way, okay. I got to uh, FaceTime with your grandmother, who, by the way, does <laughs> have a strong Australian accent. Yes, she does. The creative women, strong mm. women, mm -hmm. independent women. You come from that line. It seems like your daughter also has inherited that gene. I mean, uh, speak to the legacy of, of that, what you carry now, I feel like, on your shoulders. You've got to have that immense pride, and I'm sure your, your family's so proud of you that you're doing the dream that they've all had. Yeah. Well, I think um, I, I don't feel, I guess, not a sense of pride because it's really all I've ever known. It's kind of like mm -hmm. if you're an Army brat, you, normally you end up going into the military too because you see your family and you want to be a part of what your family does. It's like breathing for you. It's just, yeah, yeah second nature. Like doctors will have kids that mm. go into medicine, you know, because that's what they've seen and heard. Farmers will have At farmer, the dinner yeah. table. Absolutely, you know? yes. So I, I think it's, um, I don't think of it as anything necessarily special or different than what someone else does. It's just all we've known. Thank you Thank so you. much for, you for visiting. Too. Appreciate you. Thank you. Jamie O'Neill from the John Deere stage. This has been On the Record. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time here on RFD TV.